If you are a Buffalo Sabres fan, fortunately, there are still 81 more games left to go. Not a good season opener for the Buffalo Sabres on Thursday night. Anyway, thank you, everyone, as always, for tuning in to Talking Buffalo, your weekday daily driver for Buffalo Sports Talk and more. I am Patrick Moran. I am joined tonight. We are taping this really late on Thursday night with my good buddy, PK, from the Buffalo Sports Collective. Uh, what's going on, bud? And, I, and I'll tell you, so we talked briefly before we started uh, recording, and a couple of buddies of mine had a, an extra ticket for the game, and the Sabres home opener at the arena tonight. Uh, and this was like early afternoon. And I said, no, I can't because I was committed to doing a, you know, season opening podcast uh, recap, win or lose. And, um, but I was really upset for a, a good chunk of the day. Not so upset right now that I miss it. Don't get me wrong. Better days to come for the Buffalo Sabres, but this was not one of them. What's going on, PK? How you doing? Not much. Uh, I mean, I might be one of those weird ones, but I actually prefer all watching all the games from my couch. Like I, I, I'll go to the games like uh, with the being the bandit season ticket holder, you get yeah. two free Sabres tickets. So I'm definitely going to use them. If the opportunity presents itself, I'm going to go to the games, but I much prefer, and I think it might just be traffic related and like the mass amount of people that are there, but I'd rather just be sitting on the couch because if it's ugly, you can just go. <laughs> hey, uh, so true, man. Um, a recurring guest, good buddy of mine, Tone Pucks. It's funny you say that. We got in a fight a couple weeks ago on the show because he offered me a ticket to the Miami game, and I didn't want to go to it, the, the Bills game. And kind of the same reasons. I'm I'm the same, man. I prefer to be home and watch it. It's just more comfortable. I could go on for days, and I won't do that. But there's there's lots of reasons for me to, to rather be at home or at a bar or with a couple buddies or by myself than be at a stadium with the traffic and everything else. Um. And like I said, I mean, it was a fun crowd leading up to the game early on, but the Rangers just completely took them a lot of it. A 5-1 victory for the Rangers over the Buffalo Sabres on opening night. We'll talk about the game in just a second. Let me ask you this, because I know, you know, you have your podcast and you guys cover Bill Sabres, and especially the Bandits. Um, so I know you're a Sabres fan. Did today feel a little bit different than, say, the past handful of years? Because it did for me. Like, I woke up today. More excited than normal for us. I'd probably have to go back to maybe Jack Eichel's debut to be uh, as excited as I was for a Sabre season opener. Like, what was your vibe? Did you get right into it when you woke up today? I mean, that that's a good question because my wife asked me the exact same question like 30 minutes. Like, I was watching the pregame, and my wife asked me the exact same question. She goes, when was the last time you were this excited for a season opener? And I went the same answer as you. I think yeah. it was Jack Eichel's opener. And it, it, you haven't felt that like last year going into it, we were like, I'm not expecting playoffs. I just want meaningful games in March and April. And we got that. And now this year it's the expectation is playoffs are bust. And I know it was a bit shaky and we'll dive into it, but this was like, you're actually excited. Like the, you got the Darlene and the power contracts before the season started. So you don't have to worry about them for years to come. And it, prior prior you know franchise administrations it's been okay all these star players are going to end up walking out the door now you got your whole core locked up the the future's bright the playoffs are right there people are actually picking you to make the playoffs now it's a different feeling that i haven't felt in what like eight years nine years yeah. something like that yeah for sure and for people who are watching or, or listening to the show first of all thank you again very much for tuning in we're going to talk some buffalo bills Primarily some things that I'm really looking forward to seeing now that we've talked about the injuries ad nauseum. I've been beefing with Bills fans on Twitter all week. They are not happy with me by and large. But anyway, we'll get to that uh, in a little bit. Obviously, this being the, the home opener and the season opener for the Sabres, we'll definitely spend some time on that. Let me ask you this before we get into this game specifically, because it kind of relates to this game a little bit. I had Joe Yurden on earlier this week. And I kind of casually, like, we were talking a little bit about the Sabres preseason finale last Friday against Pittsburgh. And they put seven goals on Devin Levi, and they just, you know, they dominated the game. And Joe's like, which is not wrong, but Joe was talking about, you know, Pittsburgh was playing like they were trying to get in the playoffs. 
where the Sabres, their kind of mindset was, oh, well, you know, it's the preseason. I kind of feel like maybe that mindset that the Sabres, just the way they looked in the preseason, and I've talked about this on the show a few times, PK, where, you know, the the hype with Zach Benson was the big story. The deals with Darlene and then power today kind of took away from a lot of the stuff in preseason is preseason. I get that. But like there were signs with the Sabres over these last couple of weeks, preseason or not, that things were like a little bit loose defensively. And it just, I don't know, the offense didn't seem to be clicking. Again, they got their asses beat in the finale by Pittsburgh last week. And I kind of, I don't know, man, I feel like maybe it carried over a little bit into the regular season. Yeah, I, I try to reserve any kind of serious judgment until like the first five or six games are out there because mm-hmm. it's going to take them a bit because, you know, the whole preseason, I think there were seven games. Sure. There was what one game, the very, very final game where the whole team was actually played right. together. And I'm not trying to make excuses for their performance tonight, but it's I, I try to reserve a little bit of judgment just because I, I going both starting from bills talking about them for a month where every game is like do or die and then transitioning into the sabers you kind of got to like switch it a little where it's like hey it's one of 82 you know you're going to drop one every once in a while but i i do tend to agree just based on how they came out and performed in game one here where it was your stars really weren't stars. There was a lot of sloppy play in your own end. I know Rangers played their butts off on their defensive end. You couldn't get any shots through and we'll dive into it. But it, it did seem like whatever happened in the Pittsburgh game slowly squeaked into game one here. And I'm hoping they can stop that and nip it in the butt and not be prior Buffalo Sabres. But I mean, time will tell as we move on. towards. You know, you, you live and die with every Bills game and you're right. And it yep. kind of like, what happened Sunday in London kind of makes this, it's like, all right, man, it's one game. Let's chill. I'm not like the, you know, the red flags aren't out for me whatsoever. I'm also not surprised. This is a young team, a young team with a lot of expectations on them. You just spoke about it. The expectation is the playoffs. Now last year was like, maybe we can make a nice little run and and surprise some people this year. You kind of said it, it's playoffs or or bust, or certainly feel like they're going backwards if they don't make it. So maybe very early on game one at home, uh, you know, an 18 year old rookie in the lineup. Um, maybe they, they, they felt it a little bit early on. They certainly looked like they felt it. Um, you spoke of those contracts too, by the way, before we talk about this game. So Darlene, everybody knew that was coming eight years, 88 million. That's a surprise. I don't think to anybody that's been rumored that it was essentially done now for months. Finally get, you know, cross the, uh, cross the T's dot the I and, and it's done. But power, were you a little bit surprised about that seven years? I was thinking that there was a good chance that either he maybe he probably would get some kind of bridge contract, but he'd sign now and he's locked in. And I'm not complaining. I love the deal. But seven years, 58 million. Did that surprise you a little bit that they got that done before the season started? I was fully expecting a bridge deal. And I think it's because I'm still not all the way out of past year's Buffalo Sabres where it's players aren't completely bought in. I think the seven years shows that he's bought into this young core, that he's bought in, that he believes that this is the core that's going to get them over that hump. I I mean, I, I, he could have just said, Hey, I'm signing a three-year deal, four-year deal. I'm signing a bridge deal to get me to that major money. He could have done that. He could have been like, Hey, this is my money. This is my mindset. This is my life. I got to make my money where I can. And he took what I think is going to end up being a very, very team friendly deal. Sure. Which I'm fine with it. All. I'm, I'm players first, get your money because your, 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 your lifespan in this league is very short, but on the other side of it, Team friendly deal. There's more money to spread around to those young guys like JJ Paterka and Quinn and Krebs and and uh give it Devin Levi next year when he's coming up too. Yeah, man. I mean, look, if you're a fan of this team, if you believe in this team, you you can't help but love what Kevin Adams has done, lock it in this court. Proving me wrong. <laughs> and, and again, let's uh I, well, I shouldn't say let's because you're always kind of chill. I listen to you all the time. You're, you know, your demeanor is way better than mine. I'm the knee jerk uh, hothead, you know, the one overreacts to everything. So I was like, I'm tempted to get pretty pissed off about this game. Not going to do it, though. One game in. But in terms of tonight, and again, we are taping this late on Thursday night after 
uh, the game. Sabres lose to the Rangers 5-1. to one. couple big picture things. Um, and then maybe we'll get into a couple things a little more specifically before we get into Bill's talk. The Sabres power play tonight, especially in the back end of the game. They got a couple chances to really get back in this game. Just couldn't get anything to click. I said at the time that I only put out like maybe one or two tweets during this whole game. But one of them was, I don't think I've ever seen a team block more shots on the power play in my life. I found out after the game, they blocked 13 shots, the Rangers, in the third period alone. Seven while the Sabres were on the power play. So a ton of blocked shots. And to me, the key of the game was the Sabres were down 3-1. to one. They're on the power play. Shot after shot gets blocked. Puck gets in their own zone. Gets loose. Dowling gets kind of beat. Um, Bench is caught standing around a little bit. And bam, shorthanded goal. It was Creter who scored a second of the game. And 4-1. And, you know, that was a wrap. But kind of speak about what the Rangers were able to do in terms of blocking so many shots. And also, that 1-3-1 one, one defense that is so frustrating to watch on TV. I had people who were at the game complaining to me that, you know, it was kind of they were making the game more boring, but whatever, it's effective. And if something works on a, a young scoring team like the Sabres, you're going to see a lot more of it. But kind of speak on what the Rangers were able to do in this game. Yeah, I mean, that one three one has been known to kill the Sabres in the past. I think Oposo was even just saying in the post-game conferences yeah. where he was just going, hey, this has killed us in the past. we got to learn from it. Simplify. I know it, it, it makes the games boring to watch, but coaches don't care if it's boring to watch if you're going to win it. It's just the Sabres, they had like, what, one or two good chances on the rush when they were actually moving their feet and getting down the ice. And the one came, you know, power shot got blocked. It bounced right to JJ Paterka who cashed it home. The other one was Krebs got it across the ice and Johnson rang it off the post. So those yeah. were like the main two opportunities that I can remember off the top of my head that I didn't take notes on that. They actually, it, it looked good, but that was because they got in the zone before they were able to set up that one, three, one that they just couldn't break. But on the power play, like you were saying, the block shots, they had 23 total block shots in the game. Like you said, 13 in third period. They had wow. 24 shots on net the whole game. Nah. Like <laughs> we, I think we were talking about on our, our show last year, their main mark, they want to get around like that 30 shot mark is when they look like peak savers. So I, I'm not even thinking about that, but the power play, it was just too boring. They were standing on the perimeter too often. So yeah, the Rangers were blocking those shots and it looked unbelievable, but the Sabres were buying right into it. Like they were going right into those block shots. Darlene, how many times did you have to get blocked from the point before you went, okay, fake this shot, let them drop. You find somebody in the point, easy goal. It's just, I, I understand it's game one. I'm trying not to overreact, but mm. it's just, it was the same stuff a lot of times last year with their power play where it was just too slow. They were looking for those one timers that just weren't cashing in. And it seems like the teams are just adapting to that and just going, Hey, they're not going to change their mindset. Let's just keep playing this way. Cause it, they're, it's going to be the same way. You know, a lot of times, and then you've watched hockey enough to know this, yeah, a score can be lopsided, but it doesn't always tell the story. Lots of times you could be out playing a team and it seems like every little break goes against you and bam, the puck is in your net. This wasn't one of those games. Like, I think the Sabres were just thoroughly beat yep. in this se uh, season opener. I mean, they were outshot. They were outchanced. We've been talking about the block shots. You know, time of possession, five on five. Uh, the power play for the Rangers was better. Uh, the penalty kill for the Rangers was better. The Rangers scored four minutes into the game and never really felt like the Sabres were truly in this game at any point. This was as lopsided uh, as the score in the case, you agree with that, PK? I, I think this was pretty lopsided, quite frankly. Yeah, I mean, I there was one moment where it was four on four, and it was after the Kreider hit on Yoki Haru, and then that cheap, cheap <laughs> cross checking penalty on Greenway. I don't know how that it yeah. should have been four on Kreider and two on Greenway, but it, it honestly should have just been two minutes to Kreider. It, there, it wasn't even a cross check, he was just getting in there, he didn't escalate it at all. He was just saying, Hey, you can't do that to my guy, but. Mm. There was that four on four opportunity where I thought they dominated that possession where it was just they were just doing whatever the heck they wanted to the Rangers. They dominated that whole four on four uh, opportunities there. But then I think that was pretty much it. Like there weren't very many other chances or opportunities mm. that I saw that Buffalo was truly in charge of this game. They were laying the bodies early, but then Rangers were coming back doing the same thing. The biggest thing that is still going to be worrying to me and it's going to be something that I'm keeping an eye on all season because I was I was ticked about it last year 
their penalty kill is terrible. I know yeah. they went one for four tonight on it, but how many opportunities do you have to see where the guys are just lost out there? They seem like they don't know what they're doing. They don't know where they're supposed to be. And I know it's five on four. I get it. But there was one time in the second period where they were trying to kill off a penalty and Krebs is standing in the middle of the ice and there's a Ranger wide open behind him and he has no idea he's back there. How do you not, how do you reach the NHL and you're not aware of your surroundings? Shouldn't that be number one? Like knowing where all the players are on the ice, you shouldn't just be puck watching. And I think that's what they do too often is the four guys on the ice just watching the puck and just go, oh, that's a nice little round puck over there. You know, speaking of puck watching, and that's the other thing about this game for the Rangers. It just felt like every time they had an opportunity, whether it was the Sabres making a mistake or a bad officiating call, which there was one, the Rangers just kind of pounced on it, at least when the game was still in question. You know, you you talked about watching the puck, that first Rangers goal. Yoki Haro kind of got, yeah, he got kind of stuck, um, you know, just looking at the puck. And then Lafreniere skates past him to the side of the goalpost and and tucks it in. And bam, the Sabres are now one nothing. And then a bad officiating call. Zach Benson got called for hooking replays and gifts on Twitter showed that clearly it was Adam Fox. He kind of grabbed the hold of his stick and pulled it in. And the, the referee saw or thought that that was Benson hooking. So he goes to the box and almost instantly uh, Kreider cashes in on the power play. So then he got two goals right there, you know, off the bat. And, and the Sabres just weren't able to uh, to come back from it. And they had a couple chances, like like you spoke of, especially the uh, – Eric Johnson won. And then uh and then it's three nothing. Bam. You know, like there was a loose puck near Rock Boso. He doesn't come up with it. Uh and then bam. You know, it's in the net and, and it's three nothing. It was just from there, it was pretty much uh it was just over. I don't know. It's just isn't hockey so different than football. It's just because it's easy to just say just one of those nights and forget it. You really football, you really don't have that luxury to just say, yeah, you know, it's just one of those Sundays, shit happens. On to the next one, no big deal. Because every game in football is a big deal. But let's be careful here, PK, because what happened last year? How many points did the Sabres miss the playoffs by? One, two? two. About two, They were one point back. Right, they would have lost, they the, lost tiebreaker. the tiebreaker. Yeah, yeah, right. So two points. So one regulation victory more yeah. away from uh, from making the playoffs. So, again, these games actually do matter, even if it kind of you get that vibe. Um that, that it doesn't feel like that. Let me ask you this. Looking back at the game now, who stood out for you, if anybody, in a in a positive way? Let's let's start there. Like who stood out for you in a good way for the Sabres in this mostly lackluster uh home opener? I thought Darlene and Samuelson pair, they played pretty well back on the defensive end. Okay. I mean, you're kind of expecting it to be your top pair defenseman, but I thought they played the best out of the six back there. Uh, Benson, I mean, first game rookie, 18 years old, what buck 60 out there. I mean, Truba dropped him and just getting cross-checked in the back and he just stood up face to face with him, but he just always seemed to be in the right position. He gave the, uh, sh- uh, Sisterkin a little chip shot at the end there trying to, once he made the save, I like that little edge he's got there. Um, uh, but he's definitely. He didn't look lost out there. I, I like the first game. There's more to expect from him moving forward. But again, mm-hmm. first game, 18 years old, coming right from juniors. I mean, I can't expect much more from him. But the player that stood out above and beyond everybody else was not somebody I was expecting. I didn't. I was excited to see where he took his game this year because he was finally healthy. Jordan Greenway was yeah. all over the ice today. I thought yep. he was their best player by far. Now, he's not on the score sheet. You're going to, if you're just looking at the box score, you might be, okay, he didn't really do much, didn't come up with any points. He was everywhere. I mean, he had that nice tip away where it should have just been an easy goal on uh, where I think Darlene was the one that was dropped into the ice, blocking that uh, cross pass, and he got his stick in there. I mean, he was the first one in on Yoki Haru. He was laying the body in a few big checks, but he was just all over the ice. I really liked his play, and if that's the green way we're going to get all year, they're going to have a very solid third line. You know, Going into the season, and I looked at the lines. I'm like, man, I'm not really loving Greenway with Middlestad and Benson. It just doesn't feel like it's a good fit for me. Well, I was wrong based on this game because Greenway was good. He was the best player on this team, and I don't even think it was close either. But he was far and away the best player. I don't care if he didn't have a point or not. I know Baturka scored, did a couple things. He, he wasn't bad, but um, far and away for me, it, it was definitely Greenway. The other play too that I forgot to talk about. So the Sabers were were down. 
three to one, desperately trying to get back into the game. And when we talked about that power play and all those blocks, and then Benson, who had a, I think Benson had an up and down game, man. He he did some good things offensively. He was digging in the corners, far more physical for me and an eighteen year old kid than I thought. That really surprised me a lot, in a good way. But um, on that shorty, he kind of uh got caught standing around a little bit, and then Creeter, like I said, he scores that short hander. And then that's the game right there because now it's four to one when the Sabres were uh, trying to get it in. Anyway, yeah, I, I, I'm having a hard time after Greenway coming up with somebody whose game that I, quite frankly, that I really liked. I mean, I thought Gergesons looked okay. Um, you know, he didn't really cough up the puck and didn't make any big mistakes. Uh, yeah, I just, I don't know, Cousins had showed some speed at times, but they did a good job of containing Cousins and Tage Tops and the two Sabres big centers. Middle stat too. These get those guys really never got a chance to get going. Yeah, I didn't mind Connor Clifton either. I mean, he's a man. he's a lot smaller than I thought he was going to be, but man, can he lay the body? I saw him coming across and he almost put a ranger into the Buffalo bench. I mean, he's gonna lay the body. I think he's I'm again, I'm trying not to overreact and shake things up after one game, mm-hmm. but I would almost like to see what a Clifton and uh power pairing would be like if you drop down Yoki Haru because I really thought that was their plan going in I was like okay you're finally getting Yoki Haru off top four minutes you're dropping him down to the the bottom three you're bumping Connor Clifton up I would like to see that even just mixed in every once in a while I would like to see that pairing just see what it would look like because Clifton's more of that stay-at-home defense and bruiser guy that's going to allow Owen Power to be that free roamer I know Owen Power is not going to be that offensive producer like Dalene is but he's got the ability to make some moves and join the rush I mean you saw that with it generated the JJ Paterka goal but it's just I'm, I don't know if I'm going to be a fan of seeing power with Yogi Haru again this year, but I thought Clifton played a very solid game uh, on that third pairing. Yeah, nice hit. Um, One other thing, too, that I wrote down, and again, let, let me emphasize this for people who are watching or listening. It's not like we got to sleep on this game and then take a bunch of notes and, and have thoughts to formulate over several hours. We're taping this less than 20, 25 minutes after the final horn um goes off. And the one other thing I got in my notes that uh that I thought of is maybe it's because they just haven't played together much at all, if, if any, during the preseason. But that Tage, Skinner, Tuck line, they look a little bit, a little bit rusty to me, man. Um, a couple, like especially on the power play, Tage Thompson missed the only one shot. Maybe it's because he was so afraid that their shot his shot was gonna get blocked. But man, he rifled like at least two, maybe three shots, probably eight, eight feet or more off the net. I mean, it wasn't even close. That line didn't really do much at all uh, tonight in this opener. And then you start to wonder, because Benson was skating with Tage and Skinner for almost the entire preseason in camp, and Tuck was playing on a line with Middlestat. I kind of thought that's what they were going to go into the season with, but changed it up uh, you know, over these last handful of days. But you kind of sense that a little bit, a little bit of rust on that uh, big-time Sabres number one line. Yeah, I mean, they got shut down by that one three one defense. I mean, there's no other way to say it. I definitely agree with you. I thought that was going to be their plan going in as well. I know you don't want to overuse an 18-year-old rookie and put him out on first time in the NHL on first pairing. I mean, I get that, but mm-hmm. you used him so much up there, and that line was so good in preseason. And again, I know it's preseason, but I thought doing that, would have brought more offense to the third pairing with Middlestad, give him a partner over there with Alex Tuck who can produ- produce points. I thought that was going to be it. But the first and the second lines who you're expecting to be the stars and the point producers, they just came up short in this game. I, I really think that one, three, one zone killed them. My, again, I'm trying not to pick apart lines. I want to see what they look like, like five game segments. Like I, I like to do is just, game one through five and then six through 10 and then go from there, but almost bump up Krebs to that second line bump Olafson out of the lineup and put Jost on that fourth you line. Might see that too. I would have liked to see that, but I mean, it, is it December yet? Can Jack Quinn come back yet? I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited to see him in this lineup and you got to wait until December to see it. You know, I, I didn't even have to wait to the post game to say this. It's not going to be long before Tyson Jost is in that lineup and it probably will be, unless Olofsson starts out really hot and tonight obviously wasn't that um, I could see him out of this lineup pretty, uh, pretty soon. All right. So look, all the uh, expectations going into the season, I get it. I'm excited. Just like a lot of other 
people are, most people are. But ultimately, all the scoring in the world, and I, I think the Sabres were, what, third in scoring last year in the NHL? You got to stop the puck from going in your net. So ultimately, the success of this team is going to come down to playing better defense. It's going to come down to, you talked about this, a hugely underrated point, the penalty kill. It's got to be better this year. And then sometimes, flat out, goalie, the goaltending just needs to be better than it was last year. Uh, tonight for Devin Levi, he wasn't bad. Um, he had some nice saves. I would say only one of the goals was just 100%, like, just got beat. That Panarin shot, um, it, it just beat him. You know, I mean, he got the puck, came in alone, but he just put a really good shot on and beat him. The rest, one was a a, a tip. Um, one was, like I said, a, a breakdown with the defense. Got it out. I could go on forever. My point is this. I thought Devin Levi was all right tonight, but I, I, he's going to need to be better. Sometimes if the guys aren't playing in front of you, well, you just got to find a way to make a couple more saves. And that just didn't happen tonight. That's just yeah, my I thought he, it. Yeah, I thought he bailed them out on a couple. Mm -hmm. I, I want to watch that Panarin one back because it almost seemed like he was in the position to make that save. And I want to see if Samuelson got a piece of it at all where it changed directions. I got like like you said, this took place like 25 minutes ago. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, right, right. So right, we didn't right. have time to break it all down. But I kind of want to go back and see if that did get tipped at any way to get him because usually he would come up with those kind of saves but just to I, i'm not trying to be so negative in game one but i mean they did get the doors blown off this is another reason why i wanted them to bring in a veteran established goalie behind levi because I, I, again he could flash we had we saw a nine game segment last year of him just playing outstanding and he dominated the rangers last game and uh, last year in both of the games that he played but it's it's what happens if he gets burnt out playing the number one role and you're stuck with either Comrie or UPL? And I don't think either of those. I thought Comrie played pretty well in the preseason. I thought he earned the number two job, but I still wish they would have brought in a veteran presence. And this is weird saying after game one, but you can overreact a little when you get blown out 5-1 after the expectations were through the roof. <laughs> you're talking to King overreactor here, man. Um, well, yeah, dude was in college a year ago. He was playing college hockey a right. year ago. And even when he came up at the end of the year, I don't think there was expectations. It's kind of like, I feel like last year, Devin Levi was playing with house money. You yep. know, you come up and you're not ready yet. And, and, and it looks at, oh, you're whatever. you just got done playing college. He'll be back again at some point. And then he plays good. Now it's like, again, expectations. he's the number, he's the number one goaltender on a team that is now expected to make the playoffs. So it's a lot of pressure. And he's not the reason they lost this game, though. No. This wasn't a literal team loss. Yep. Again, an organizational loss. Everything about this game, they just got beat in every way that you can get beat in one game. And last point, before we take a break, and then we get in some Bills talk here, that 1-3-1 one, is not going away. You look at the schedule, and they are in, uh, what is it, Brooklyn now? It's not Long Island anymore. They're playing on the road against the Islanders on Saturday. I think you're going to see plenty more of this defense. It's kind of like the Bills, you know. If you figure out that we're not going to let guys get behind us and we're going to make Josh dink and dunk down the field, some defenses incorporate that to you prove you could beat it. Kind of think you're going to get that with the Sabres. You're going to see a lot more of this defense to the Sabres, like Kyle Apostol said, post game. So they simplify things and find a way to uh, to beat it and get themselves in better positions that teams can't do that. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll finish on a positive note. The What they did pregame for RJ – my God, this franchise has went from just ignoring past players. Like, I think, what was it, Pominville that came back and they just ignored him and they didn't even do anything? Yeah, any that, that, that was terrible. Yep, yep, yep. My God, that that video tribute to him, the RJ Way ban or, um, sign out front now, they are doing everything within like the last two or three years to bring their franchise back to one of the top tier ones that respects their their history and the players that came through and the, the, the people that came through the organization, that one got me. And I, I, I understand that going in, the players might've had that feeling as well. And then they just dropped the ball on it. But the, the first thing I saw once I watched it, I was like, they have to go win this whole damn thing now yeah. for RJ. I was like, Holy crap. It was like it was man. bringing the feelings back and it was like, you have to go win the whole stinking thing now because of what it would mean to this whole city and especially RJ. Yeah, look, man, I'm not going to let a Sabres opening night stinker uh, detract me from 
the day as a whole. Again, just being excited to be a Sabres fan. The RJ ceremony tribute that you talked about. Um, the party in the plaza outside. I've seen videos on the news it's great. and on social media all day. People just partying. Like It's fun to have a team that you're excited about and for them to be back is one game. No big deal. But I will say, let's not start the season like two and six. And put your, you know, you don't want to put yourself in a hole that you're going to be spending a lot of time uh, digging out. We don't want to see that either, or my uh, my attitude might change pretty damn quick. Anyway, we're going to take a real quick break, come back, and uh, plenty of Buffalo Bills talk too to come. So be right back. All right, I am back with PK from the Buffalo Sports Collective on the Bills side. I've had a rough week with, with fans. Um, I don't know if you saw it, but anyway, a- after last week's loss in London, which whatever, the loss is the loss, but losing Matt Milano and Daquan Jones, I'm going to say for the season. I know technically it's likely for the season, but I'm going to say for the season. I, I, I essentially said that if Brandon Bean doesn't make a, a significant trade, that I think the Bills Super Bowl chances are pretty much nil. And I got attacked a lot. Some of it rightfully too, by the way. Someone called me smug and negative. I was like, all right, maybe I am a little being a little bit smug and negative here. Tough shit though. It's my show. I'll say and do what I want. But anyway, um, I asked people, I said, I don't think there's any precedent ever for a team to have three. Let me ask you this, PK. Let's start here. Mamelano to you, is he one of the best three players on this team? Three or four players? I would say, do you agree that yeah, he's, one, he's of one of the ones that you can't lose? Yeah. Right. Okay. And I would say Daquan Jones and, and Trey white are two of the best six, eight players on this team. Maybe, you know, so you're yep. talking one of your top three to four players and overall three of your best eight players. And you just lost them all for the season. I don't know of any team ever that has won a super bowl, losing three of their best six, seven players on a football team, especially this early in the season. And, uh, People came at me, and in fairness, I don't have the person's name, but one person, I was wrong because it's not completely unprecedented. The Philadelphia Eagles back in 2017, they lost Carson Wentz, their quarterback, when he was having an MVP season. They lost Jason Peters, their Pro Bowl left tackle, and uh, their middle linebacker, Jordan Hicks, who was a good linebacker, had five interceptions the year before. Lost all three of them for the season, still won the Super Bowl. So it's not completely unprecedented, but it's almost as nearly um, unprecedented. I, I just, before I get into a couple of specific topics with you, like what is your feeling right now about this roster? Do you think that this, there's still enough talent on this defense that they could be fine and still be reasonably competitive? Do you think it is an absolute necessity that Brandon Bean uh, plucks a corner or a linebacker or a defensive tackle or somebody from another team? What do you think is going to happen? In terms of trades, if any, and what do you think the Bills should be doing right now? So we record our show Monday nights, and they come out on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So people must not have heard my take yet if they were going after you, because I said about the same thing. (laughs) I said they lost White, Milano, and Jones. If you're looking at this team and saying they're going to win the Super Bowl, their Super Bowl contender, as is right now, you're crazy. And you come after me now. But it's just... I I can't see how you can lose, like you said, three of the possibly top eight best players on your whole team for the season. Again, season, but and still expect expect to win the Super Bowl. I mean, it's going. I would love to be wrong because I'll be out there partying with everybody else if they bring home that Super Bowl trophy. But I I just I can't see it because you can't lose Tre'Davious White. Who's going to back him up? There isn't anybody. You saw what Elam can do. Who's let me let, let, yeah. let me cut, let me cut you off on that one point because this is what I got more than anything else, and I want you to continue yours. But I will say, what I heard, and it's not wrong to be fair. Trey White, they won thirteen games without him before. That is true. They right. they did. I I think they can win without him, but that's Tre'Davious White. Yeah, they won thirteen games without Tre'Davious White. They didn't win 13 games without Matt Milano. They didn't win 13 games without Daquan Jones. It's the, the three. <laughs> it's the three there. Like who's I, I, I like Dorian Williams. I liked what I saw in preseason. I think he's the one to go to, but he's a rookie third round rookie. You're trying to take over for a pro bowl linebacker. 
Daquan Jones, you saw in the Cincinnati game what happens when he's not there. And the run game, uh, the the run stopping, it, they're not good this year against the run, it, 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 even with Daquan Jones. And he's gone now. Those three pieces that are arguably the three pieces that you couldn't lose on the defensive end, you don't have anymore. And I guess the the one benefit looking forward is you didn't lose them on the offensive end. Like you didn't lose Diggs, you didn't lose Allen, you you didn't lose uh, Dawkins, you didn't lose Mitch Morris. So the benefit is you're going to have to score points to yeah. win in this league. So you didn't lose them on the offense. I still think they're making the playoffs. I'm not calling them for like they're not going three and what is it fourteen. They're they're gonna be a double digit win team. I see that happening. I think they even still have a shot at the AFC East. I just I can't see them getting to the Super Bowl and winning it as the team stands right now. Let me say this. Um, losing Daquan Jones, we saw it last year with Cincinnati. And this year, I, I did a show with Aaron Quinn literally a week ago before the game, obviously. And I said, I can make a very fair case here that Daquan Jones is the defensive MVP so far through the first month of the season for the Buffalo Bills. He's great. And... He's, I, you know, Puna Ford will, will step in and he'll do some things, but he's not Daquan Jones. But of those three guys that they lost, as good as I think Daquan Jones is, and again, I said he was potentially my defensive MVP on this team. I still think he's the most, he's the most replaceable of the three because I like Puna Ford. Um, Matt Milano, you just, you're not replacing Matt Milano. You're just not going to do it. And in terms of trades with Brandon Bean, and by the way, Trey White too, was about 90, 95% of what he was before he first got hurt to begin He's with. Playing good. thought he was playing really, really well. Um, when it comes to those guys, if, if when it, my thing was with trading, I mean, people, well, you're not going to be able to trade for another Matt Milano or Trey White. Of course you're not. You're not. No team is going to give up a, a talent like Trey White or on power of Matt Milano. And there's only a couple that are on power of Matt Milano in the NFL. I said, but that's not my that's not my measuring stick. I want to upgrade over Josh Norman or Kyle Elam. I want to upgrade over Tyrell Dodson or Dorian Williams. That's what I want Brandon Bean to go on and find right now. And I like Dorian Williams as, as just like you do, but he is a rookie. He he played last week. He was in position to make plays. He had a nice pass breakup too, but he nice whisked on some tackles, made a couple of mistakes in the run defense, and, and he got benched for. Terrell Dodson, who actually came in and played well, which that's tough for me to say because I am not a Terrell Dodson guy, you know, whatsoever. But I don't know, man. I just I, I think they're going to have a difficult time. I I still think they're going to win games. I still think they very well can make the playoffs. We'll talk about that, too, at the very end here. But now going forward, there's a couple of things that I, I think that uh, we're looking forward to seeing starting Sunday. Well, hopefully they will. Is Kyrie going to get another chance? And if he does get another chance, is he going to take advantage of it? Now, Dane Jackson did not practice on Wednesday or Thursday because of a foot. Generally speaking to me, especially if it's a skill position guy, if you miss practice Wednesday and Thursday, not even on a limited basis, he didn't practice at all. Chances are he ain't playing on Sunday. I'm Christian Benford's back. That's the good news. But without Dane Jackson, that means it's either Kyrie Elam or it's Jamarcus Ingram. Do you kind of feel like if you're the organization or you're the coaches, if there's a game that Kyrie Elam's ever going to get right, it would be against the Giants coming up with a terrible offensive line and probably Tyrod Taylor, the quarterback. If you want to get your guy out there and get him some confidence and see if he can do it, it's now or never, ain't it? Yeah, against a team that's got what seventeen players on the injury report right now. Yeah, <laughs> that terrible. would be the that would be the team. I I never thought I would be in the position that I would be begging for Dane Jackson to be healthy and playing. I was not a fan of Dane Jackson last year. I was not a fan of him in the off season. I was the one banging the table saying, why is Kyrie Elam not getting the opportunity over Dane yeah. Jackson? I look like an idiot after last game, but I look like an idiot on a normal basis. So it's not anything different, but I, I think this is the game where you can shake off the, the Jaguars game. Hey, everything fell apart. The, I, I related the bills offense to Shaun of the dead, the zombies and Shaun of the dead. They were just walking around, like I, I zombies, it, it was an unbelievable performance by the offense and not in a good way. But I think Elam, if you like exactly like you said, if you want to build up his confidence, you're going to be covering guys like uh, Darius Slayton. You're going to be covering guys like I don't even think Wondell Robinson's going to be healthy enough to play. You're going to be facing guys like Hodgson. I this would be the opportunity if he's going to get that confidence and that you know, swagger back. This would be the game to do it because I'm, I'm 
hoping that Daniel Jones can play because I He's I'd not. rather see yeah I'd rather see Daniel Jones than Tyrod Taylor. Too. It's, it's weird, isn't it? Weird to say that yep. when you're rooting, you're hoping the starter could play because you think that the starter is worse than the backup. That's crazy. The starter is worse than the backup because he holds on to the football and this offensive line is just putrid. This is the worst. This might be the worst team in the NFL that they're playing on Sunday night. But that's my thing. If Kyrie Elam doesn't get to start, and let's say Jamarcus Ingram gets to start alongside Christian Benford, if you see that on the first snap of the game, if you have, if you have a Kyrie Elam jersey, sell it. Give it away to somebody. Donate it to the Salvation Army. Because I'm telling you now, if he ain't in the starting lineup on Sunday, assuming Dane Jackson don't play, Kyrie Elam is done. He's done. So this is his get right opportunity, if he even has it. And if he has it, he's got to take advantage. Because to me, he got benched at the end of the game last week in London because he made a big mistake on a, on a run assignment. And um, yeah, if he's not starting, he's, he doesn't do something this game, doesn't do something positive to kind of nudge the arrow towards him, he's done. I think he's done. First round or not, second year or not, I think he's done. Yeah, I mean, if he doesn't start over Ingram, who's an undrafted player. I like him. Player. I, I like him too. But if you're a first round pick like Elam and you don't, you lose Tredavious White, you lose, you, you lose two of your starting cornerbacks and you don't get the start. I mean, your confidence is shot. The team does not believe in you. Like where is the Kyrie Elam that we saw late in the season last year? Like what happened? I, I understand it's one game, but you just look lost out there. Like he didn't, Ridley, I know Ridley's a good player, but he just made him look silly. I mean, they were targeting him over and over and over. Dane Jackson had a very solid game last week. He did. Kyrie Lim just did not look like an NFL player, and it it stinks. It's just if there's any game out there and any team you want to be going against to get this kid's confidence back up, it's the New York Giants versus Tyrod Taylor and that wide receiver group. And the, I mean, the the defensive line for the Bills is going to get to Tyrod Taylor and he's there's going to be opportunities to either get some pass breakups or some interceptions the biggest thing that Kyrie Elam can you know take from this game is if he gets a pick I mean his confidence is going to skyrocket and maybe that's exactly what he needs to bounce back to what we saw later last season it's frustrating because I could think back to that Bengals playoff you know debacle last year and I remember saying over and over Two guys on the defense showed up on that game. Matt Milano was one of them, and Kyrie Lim was the other. And that gave me a lot of confidence going into the offseason. It just never materialized. This kid had every opportunity on earth to win a job in camp in the preseason, and he didn't. And then he doesn't dress for four games. Then he dresses against Jacksonville, and he gets scorched and benched. So again, you're playing the Giants, who stink. If you're not in that starting lineup, you're done. If you're in that starting lineup and you have a bad game on film, you're done. Period. End of story when it comes to Kyrie Elam. Linebacker. I We need and hopeful to see. I don't care if it's Tyrell Dotson or Dorian Williams, but one of these guys got to emerge or God, please know A.J. Klein. I don't need to see A.J. Klein doing anything. I already know what AJ Klein is. Let's not get too overconfident if he has a good game against the stinky uh, New York Giants. I'd like to see Dorian Williams get another crack at being a starter. You know what you got in Dodson. He could be, we'll call him serviceable most of the time anyway. Uh, Dorian Williams has that little extra something that if he can figure it out and tackle better, maybe, maybe he can help you withstand, to some extent, the loss of, of Matt Milano. So I really am hopeful to see him out there and, and doing some good things. Yeah, I mean, you know what Dotson is. You know what Klein is. You don't know what Williams is right now. And like you said, there is no replacing Matt Milano. There's one mm-hmm. or two mm-hmm. linebackers in the entire league, and they're not being traded to Buffalo. They're not getting traded at all. So you're just looking for a guy that can step up. Like you said earlier, if you're looking for a trade, you're not looking for a trade to replace those guys. You're looking for a trade to replace the guys that would replace Matt Milano. But I, I think moving forward, you got to put the confidence and the trust in Dorian Williams because I think he has the most upside. And he's the one that can get the 
not the expectations to where Matt Milano was, but he's the one that can get it past what Tyrell Dodson's is and to pass what uh, Klein's is. And I know he struggled making tackles last year, last week. I saw it on uh, on the game. I'm like, oh, that's another missed tackle by Dorian Mumps. That's another missed tackle. And then eventually he did get benched. I think he they did. put him back out there towards the end of the fourth. A little quarter. bit, yeah, yeah. So I, I think he's just the guy. You got to give him the opportunity to run with it. They did it with Terrell Bernard. And you saw what happened. Like he didn't play at all in the preseason. And they're like, hey, you're our guy. Even though you didn't earn it in, in training camp in preseason because you got hurt, you're our guy. We trust you because you have the highest ceiling. I think that's the same thing with Dorian Williams. I think I almost think that you kind of had to throw him to the wolves last game because who's expecting Matt Milano to go out? Who's expecting Matt Milano to literally right. just go out? So I think it was short notice, and I think it was a lot of just third round rookie going out there and had the jitters and that giant crowd in front of London and, and all those, like all those eyes on you and you're, you're not expecting to be in the game. I think a full week in the system being next to Tyrell or uh, Terrell Bernard in the whole defensives, getting the calls. I think that's going to help him. And I think if he's the one that gets the start, I think you'll see a more preseason Dorian Williams than you saw against the Jags. You know, that's a really good point that you just made because, first of all, he's a rookie. Secondly, you're playing in London. And third, your whole, you and your entire team is shell shocked because you have Daquan Jones go down. And we didn't know it was bad until afterwards, but they know it's bad right away. You knew he tore his pack pretty much right away from what I hear. And then next drive, Matt Milano goes down. And you know that that is a serious injury, too. That's a lot for a team, any team, veteran team, young team to go through. And when you're a rookie linebacker and you're thrust into action like that, I mean, you get, you get the reps and you know, you always got to be ready to play. That's what they say, but it's different when you're a rookie and that kind of circumstance. So maybe with the whole week of prep, you know, he will be uh, up to task. I do think PK was worth noting. Sean McDermott, who is pretty vanilla generally, you know, he doesn't give you much when during his weekly press conferences, most coaches don't. So it's not really, so much a dig at him, but I found it notable that he did say when it came, some a reporter asked him how they plan on replacing Milano. And he said, we're going to start out on the inside. And if it doesn't work, we're going to look to the outside. I'm paraphrasing, but only slightly. Basically what he said is we're going to in house to start. And if it doesn't work, then we're going to have to go out and we're going to try to find somebody. So we'll see how that goes. That test for them comes starting Sunday night. And then one other guy, and you, you actually just mentioned him and I got to, admit something. This is unfair to him. I, I, I keep pushing the goalposts back with Terrell Bernard. I do. I mean, dude, I was, I was bashing this guy all off season, laughing at the thought of him becoming the middle starting middle linebacker. When Tremaine Evans signed with the bears, it didn't bother me. Cause I'm like, he doesn't deserve that much money. Nothing against Tremaine. Good for him. Go get your bag. But nah, you're not staying in Buffalo for that money. But anyway, I'm like, come on, right? Bills, we're going to sign. Are you going to bring in what veteran is going to be Wagner? It's going to be this guy, that guy. Who are they bringing in? What are they going to do? And they do nothing. And then we get to the draft, and they don't really draft a, one of the you know coveted middle linebackers, Campbell or Sanders, that we talk so much about during the draft process. I'm like, this dude ain't starting. He's not going to start. He's not going to start. Then training camp, Dodson and him are in a battle. I'm like, this is terrible. And then Bernard gets hurt, doesn't play a snap in the preseason. He didn't win the job. Tyrell Dodson lost the job over the course of camp and preseason. And then he comes out and far exceeds my expectations. Actually, I also predicted that Christian Kirksey who was on the practice squad would be the starting middle linebacker by week three. I said that in my bowl predictions episode, complete idiot that I am. Anyway, Jerome Bernard shut me up because he has been fantastic, man. Fantastic. 45 tackles, two sacks, two picks, two fumble recoveries, a couple tackles for a loss. He's played really good against the run for the most part. And now I'm going to push the goalposts even more. Because now I need him to be better. And he's been good. Damn good. But now I need him to be better because, again, you're not replacing Matt Milano. Dorian Williams ain't replacing him. A train ain't replacing him. How do you in any sport, when somebody goes down, the guys around you got to pick it up and play even better? It's a big ask to ask Terrell Bernard to play better than he is because he's playing pretty damn good now. But somehow, some way, I need him to keep making these plays and maybe even a couple more, which is moving the goalposts. Not fair, but they need it. Yeah, I just had to look back because I was trying to remember who I thought was going to win that battle because you, you had the the Klein, the the Dodson, and the Bernard, and who was going <laughs> to win it. I I had, I 
think, I mean, if I'm wrong, call me out. I think I had Bernard winning it, but in my bold predictions, I said that by middle of the season, Dorian Williams was going to take over. Mm -hmm. So I guess kind of I'm right because Dorian Williams (laughs) might get the start. So, you know, asterisk, asterisk. But uh, I, I think one benefit that you can look at is just how many big plays that Bernard has been making so far. If they would have paid Tremaine Edmonds and Matt Milano got hurt, I would feel a lot. I, I almost, it feels weird to say it only after what five games of Terrell Bernard being the middle linebacker, but I would almost feel worse having Edmonds in this place because you know, you're not going to get any of those splash plays. You're not going to get any of those nope. step up plays from Edmonds that you might get from Bernard. So I guess in a weird way, it's, it's better to have Bernard out there because you're going to get those interceptions. You're going to get those forced fumbles and the recoveries, and you're going to get possibly even get some sacks out there with Bernard out there. That's why I'm kind of in favor of putting Dorian Williams out there. Cause I think his ceiling so much higher. I know those really scary going what five career starts between the two linebackers out there. They play such a key role on the defensive end, but I, I, I think Bernard could be the one to step up last game. You got AJ Epinesa to play the career game, like unbelievable. And the offense just dropped the ball and you finally got somebody that somebody was stepping up. Milano went down. Jones went down. You got somebody to step up that you weren't expecting to step up and make those giant plays and still nothing happened. That's why I think Bernard could be the one that really does step up and lead the charge. I think this could be something, Hey, Matt Milano's not next to me anymore. I'm the one making the play calls out here. I got the green dot. I can step up and make those plays. Cause I think he has the ability to do it. Look, the bills are going through a stretch of teams right now where if you want to get Dorian Williams out there and, and try time. to get him right to get going, this is the time to do it. Um, let me give you a quick little hot take about Terrell Bernard before moving on. If the money was the same, forget the money, forget the contracts. I don't care if it's minimum wage. And I had my choice of Terrell Edmonds over the last couple of years with the Bills or what I've seen over the first five games with Terrell Bernard. I'd say goodbye again to Tremaine Edmonds. Forget the money. I like what Terrell Bernard has done in middle linebacker more than Tremaine Edmonds has done. And Tremaine does some things. That didn't show up in the box score. I get that. You see some stuff on film. Some of the very smart film people will point out um, ways that he was valuable that you don't see in the stat box. I understand that. I don't care, man. I want some splash plays. from. At some point, you fall on a fumble. An interception hits you in the numbers and you bring it in. You know what I'm saying? You get lucky and you accidentally force a fumble or something. Just never happened with Tremaine. And it's already happening a lot with Bernard. But anyway... Another point, which we're not even going to talk about because this is goes without saying, Vaughn Miller needs to get ramped up over these next few weeks. That's obvious. Don't even need to talk about that. Two more things. Number one, this has really bothered me this year because it's one of the most unpleasant surprises of this football team to me. Are the tight ends ever going to get going? Because there's been a borderline disaster. The 12 personnel, the one tight end, the two tight ends, both of them, Dawson Knox. 11 catches for 75 yards and a touchdown this season. He's only got, he's been targeted 19 times and he's only caught 11 passes. I know off the top of my head, he's got three easy drops right there. So he's been kind of a disaster. I don't know how much stock you put in the PFF grades, but he far and away has the worst grade overall of anybody on the Bills offense. In fact, his grade in London last week was the lowest single game grade of any Bills offensive player for the entire season anywhere. That's how bad he's been. And then Dalton Kincaid, I don't really put this on him so much because I still love his hands and his athletic ability. But he's only got seven, 17 catches and only for 119 yards. 6.9 yards per catch combined for both tight ends and only one touchdown through five games. Dude, what's going on, man? The tight end position is not giving the Bills what they need right now. Yeah, I mean, I think... What happened was the team themselves got everybody so excited because of everything they were saying. They drafted him in the first round. They're saying, hey, he's going to be our slot guy. We're not going to ask him to do too much blocking and all that stuff that you heard all offseason. And I'm still the one that was saying he's still a rookie tight end. You can call him whatever you want. He's still a rookie tight end in a weird way. He's doing exactly the numbers and everything that I was expecting him to do as a rookie tight end because that's what history says to do. My biggest issue with him is there's he's not getting targeted 
deep enough. Like what was the one game he finished with two catches for three yards? Like I, what is the route scheme? I, I'm not a guy that watches game film and all that kind of stuff. I'll fully admit I don't do that kind of stuff because I know I'm not good at it. I rely on the people that do it to sure. tell me what they're seeing, but it's just, he's he, the whole middle of the field. There's the slot position for the Buffalo bills offense. The last, what since Josh Allen came into the league has been a key spot. I know Dalton Kincaid's a rookie, but you would have thought that somebody else would have stepped up in that slot role because of how valuable it's been. Hardy hasn't done much. Sherfield can't even get on the field. Shakir, is he even still on the team? Like, there's nobody that's stepping up. Davis is having a solid year. And yeah. I, while I still, uh, he's winning me over, why I still think he's more of a three than a two, he has had a very solid year being that number two behind Stefan Diggs. He stepped up last game. He was great. There's just not another option besides those two. Like, what happens if you run in a team that can shut down Stefan Diggs? Like, no, nobody's been able to do it yet, but it, Kincaid has been nothing. Knox has been terrible. I mean, you read the stats and you can just watch him on the field. One of those drives ended because he just dropped one of those passes. There's three drops, I think, that ended drives last week. But those, I don't know if it's play calling. I don't know if Josh Allen's just not looking for him. But the tight ends, the expectations coming into the season, not just were high enough, but the 12 personnel that you kept hearing over and over and over, I'm pretty sure the numbers that they've ran when 12 personnel has gone down every week of the season so far. Um, Eric Turner from cover one, who's so good at film and, you know, just letting people see things that you might not otherwise see. He put some film together showing that there are instances where Dalton Kincaid is doing what he's supposed to do. And he is open in the middle of the field. But sometimes Josh is just giving the ball to Stefan Diggs, which is worse things that you can do than that. But yeah, listen, I agree, man. Diggs has been great. I I don't I do think Gabe Davis is a legitimate number two receiver at this point. But whether you think he's a two or three, that's all semantics. He's having a good season. Yep. Um, but they need someone else. They need that third guy. I agree with you in terms of slot position, just ain't doing shit. Trent Sherfield's got 39 yards receiving this season. Khalil Shakir's got 27 yards receiving this season. Had only three catches. Two of them actually were productive, including one touchdown. But still, where's the consistency? Hardy had 62 yards last week, which is good. He had a 40 or 63 yards or something like that. He had a 43-yard catch, too. Besides that one play, the slot position ain't done shit for the Bills this year. So whether you want to call Kincaid a big slot, the second tight end in line, lined up to the wide right, left, doesn't matter. Not giving him anything. Knox is not giving him anything. At some point, the the secondary options after Diggs and Gabe need to start stepping up. And I want to see more from the tight ends because this has just been, again, borderline uh, disastrous. And then the last thing is, I, you can't control it, I guess, but luck, need more injury luck. You know, this is a team, except for Bernard, who missed the camp or uh, preseason, but it wasn't a serious injury. I think that was almost more precautionary, especially in hindsight now. They knew who he was. And they wanted him ready for the season, so they weren't going to risk his hamstring. But this was a team that went through all of camp, no major injuries, first three games of the season, no major injuries, and then Boyer misses the game. And then in that same game against Miami, Trey goes down for the year, and then Rizzo's out in Jacksonville. And uh, now we know Milano and Jones are probably done for the year. Got to have some – they can – look, we're having this debate right now. Can the Bills overcome – Daquan and Milano, I can tell you one thing's for certain. That's not for a debate. They can't afford another major injury anywhere on this football team, especially on the offense now at this point as well. So Lady Luck has got to be on the Bills' side going forward when it comes to injuries. He just can't afford to lose anyone else Yeah, I mean, significantly. You would, you would think so. I mean, what, the first five years of McDermott's era, they didn't really lose any major pieces mm -hmm. that I can remember and now the last two years, it's all caught up to him. Like, <laughs> I think Lady Luck had him in the first man. five years. And now it's like, all right, now you got to pay the maker here. It's like we're coming to cash in on those five years of just letting you off scot-free. It's just you hit you. You said it perfectly. They can't afford any more injuries no. long term on the offense or the defensive end, because if they do, I mean, that's you're just going to be you know rearranging 
deck chairs on the Titanic because it's going to get ugly quick, especially if it's on the offensive end, because that's the side that you're going to have to lean on heavily to keep this team afloat. And it's, it's weird saying, because five games in they're three and two, it's not the end of the world, but your offense is going to have to pick up the slack where the defense is going to let you down a bit because they just don't have that, those star pieces on all faith. It, it's weird. You lose somebody from the DB room. You lose somebody from the linebacker room. You lose somebody from the DL uh, defensive line room. It just, it hits you in all three phases on the defensive end. And it just stinks. You know, ain't it some shit too, that like you're thinking this defense has played really good the first month of the season, which they have. And, and now you got Vaughn Miller coming back who in a couple of weeks, hopefully will be wrapped up and looking. Cause that was not Vaughn Miller that we saw. That was some dude wearing a number 40 Jersey, taking a couple of laps, a couple of reps, in London on, on Sunday, but you know, he's going to ramp up and he'll be fine. But you're like, man, we got fall coming back with this defense. Are you kidding me? And then bam, bam, bam. Just, uh, it sucks. Here's the bottom line. PK as we wrap up, I don't think you're going to learn a lot about the Buffalo bills for the next three weeks. Even if they go out three blowout wins, let's not, uh, smell the flowers too much here because at the end of the day, they're playing, the Giants at home on Sunday night, and they suck. They're playing the Patriots on the road the next week with Matt Jones, who might be the only quarterback in the NFL who might be as bad as Daniel Jones this year. And then it's almost starting to look like they're like Caleb Williams hunting right now the way the New England Patriots are playing. They are a disaster. And then you got Tampa Bay, who's been all right, but you got them on a, on a short rest, but at home in Orchard Park on prime time. Those three games to me, they don't tell you much. The Bills put it this way. If the Bills aren't six and two in three weeks, you know, it might be time to put it in your focus a little bit more on the Buffalo Sabres if you're championship hunting this year in uh, Western New York. They cannot lose these next three games. They're expected to win, and I'm not going to get too high on my own supply if the Bills win these next uh, three games. We're going to start to learn a lot that fourth week because they're going to Cincinnati. That's when you're going to start to see is Dorian Williams, is Kyrie Elam, Dane Jackson, whoever it may be, are these guys up for replacing, you know, Puna Ford, what they've lost? Because then you got Cincinnati. And you look at that schedule, dude. Oof. Oof. These next three games are chumpy. But after that, it's not. <laughs> I mean, you still got Denver and the Jets at home, too. But besides that, dude, they're at Cincinnati. They're at Philly. They're at Kansas City. They're at home against Dallas. They're on the road against the Chargers. They're on the road to end the season at Miami. You know what I'm saying? We're going to start to find out some shit about this football team, but not yet. Not yet. Yeah, I mean, we went into the season saying that the start of their season is where they need to pack their wins up because the back of the half of the season is is the tough part. I mean, that stretch that you listed, is it's, it's going to be hell. And Winning those next three games is all that more important now that you're you lost your three stars on the defensive end. Like you need to stack those wins now. These are it, it, week six is a must win. Week seven and eight are must wins. And I'm not just saying that because they're sitting at three and two and the world's ending and all that kind of stuff. I, I still believe this team can make the playoffs. And you know, as long as you got Josh Allen and Stefan Diggs healthy. Things can happen. I'm not expecting them to happen because of everything I said, but it can still happen. It's just if you lose any of those three games, I mean, if you think us two talking about our expectations are bad, there's going to be a mutiny. If you come out Sunday night and lose to Tyrod Taylor at home, that's a wrap. It'll be done. I mean, I would hate to be anybody on talk show radios or anybody that does this for a living like channel four or two and all that kind of stuff, because the comments you're going to get and the calls in that you're going to get are just going to be, you're going to be banging your head on the wall. So these next three games, uh, you're not going to learn too much unless they walk out with a loss. They have to win these games, get back to six and two, feeling good, looking like playoffs, looking, you're going to have the normal fans are going, Hey, they're six and two and the world's not ending. They're looking good. Super Bowl stuff. You're going to get everybody's confidence back. And I think that's the, the talk show of this, or the, the key word here is the confidence building everybody's confidence back up. It's they, they can't drop any of these games. They have to win it. And the, the scariest part is that, the Bills under Sean McDermott have been known to throw up stinker games against teams that you should beat. And I'm hoping they already did that versus the Zach Wilson led 
you know, Jet, Jets in week one. I'm hoping that's the the stinker of the year, but you you can't lose these next three. Otherwise, you know, your any chances you still have are are toast. Put it this way: if they lose one of these next three home game or next three games, New England's actually on the road. But if they lose one of these next three games, all the stupid shit that Stephen A. Smith or Nick Wright or anyone else is going to say nationally, it's going to be warranted. It's going to be deserved because if they can't beat those teams. They're in a shitload. They're in a world of trouble. I'll wrap by saying this, man. You look at the schedule. They're three and two. I wrote down six that what I consider easily winnable games. Like there ain't no way they should lose these games, period. I don't care who's in or who's out minus Josh Allen. You got the Giants at home. You got New England twice. You got Tampa Bay at home. You got Denver at home. And you got the Jets at home, which I even hesitate to put on there just because they always play the goddamn Bills stuff. But you're at home. You want to make the playoffs. You better beat the Jets with Zach Wilson. Perry the story. So you win all six of those. Those are six easily winnable games. They get you to nine. See, because you got three and you got those six. So that's nine. Then I'll run down again. Those other six games at Cincy, at Philly, at Kansas City, Dallas at home, at the Chargers, at Miami. Six really tough games. Five of those six on the road. You want to get to 11? You better win at least two of those five. That'll get you to 11. I think 11 safely get you in the playoffs. I don't know about winning the division. Now, look, every team I just mentioned, Josh Allen in this offense and in the defense still is very capable of going in and winning. The Bills could go into Kansas City and beat them. They could go into Cincinnati. Cincinnati has not played good this year so far. You know what I'm saying? Miami, they they play really good against Miami. That's just like the Jets play really good against the Bills. Dallas looked like shit against Frisco. The Bills can win four or five of those games easily. You know what I mean? But those are the tough games, and you got to win at least two and four of those five are on the road. Five of those six, I'm sorry, are on the road. You better win a couple of those because if you don't, you're not making the playoffs. Even if you beat those chump teams, you better beat a couple good teams if you want to get in the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, they can beat Kansas City. I mean, sure, their defense looks legit, but Mahomes hasn't been the same because he, he doesn't have any wide receivers he trusts. It's Kelsey or bust i mean dales misses kellen more more than more than anything because mike mccarthy sure he stinks he's terrible chargers drop games all the time miami you just show that you can shut again you you had matt milano and and everybody else but you could you have their number josh allen has miami's number Mm -hmm. the only game i'm terrified of is philly i mean even even now it's just their offense has to get right their offense looked like a train wreck in Jaguars. You can't afford that at all the rest of the season. They have to be on point the rest of the season. You can blame London trip all you want. I went to Italy last year, took one good night's sleep. I adjusted perfectly fine. Yes, not an NFL player, but it took one good night's sleep to adjust it. I am not using that as an excuse for the way they performed on Sunday. It's just the offense has to be the one that carries the load, and Josh Allen has to find that mean streak and quit sitting on the bench, get up, Talk to your teammates, get involved in the game, because how many more shots can I see of him wearing that hat, looking at the tablet, sitting down next to the QB coach, and not being involved? When he's playing well, he's up and moving. When he's not playing well and the offense isn't moving, he's sitting down, looking down. It's just it, it's training. you got to be involved with your, your teammates, and I think that small little twist could be the difference and, and change the outlook for the offense for the rest of the year. Could agree more, man. Could not agree more. Like at the end of the day, like I said, um, momentum matters. Injuries matter, not just for Buffalo, but for their opponents too, because they're going to go through some of the same shit too. So, you know, you just got to, you got to play one. You got to play your best football later in the season. It comes down simple as that. Last question here. I'm going to let you go. I should have asked you this earlier when we were talking Sabres, but I kind of circle back here all the way at the end. Today, part of the fun um, on social media, anyway, leading up to uh, the home opener tonight, the Sabers uh, social media dropped the the goal score, the the song list when players score goal. I can't believe how many fans love that shit. Like last year with Jeff Skinner, a uh, party in the USA, that that shit was cranking on the speakers. Everybody loved it. There's a couple good ones this year. Um, what I wanted to ask you was, let's pretend that you were actually a, a Buffalo Saber, you were a player, and. Uh, Okay, you're I'm out six there. Years old, you're... Six years old in my parents' basement. I'm ready. <laughs> you scored tonight because you and JJ Perturk are the only two who can put the puck in the net, I guess. Um, anyway, what's your goal song? What are you gonna play that the crowd's going uh b- berserk to? What's your so, goal song? 
I I knew I was coming on with you, and I I saw the the tweet out from the Sabers with all the goal songs. So knowing you, I think this is my fifth shit time on the show. I knew this question was going to be coming. So <laughs> I I've been trying to wrap my head around it, and I'm one of those. I, I, I want to make it awkward. Like when I score, I want a song being played that you're not expecting to be played. Like, what was it? Uh, um, Oh God, who was the, the, um, uh, Labushkin last year. He had like the gummy bear song. Yeah. Like I want something <laughs> like that. So I was trying to think, and I was like, I, you know, uh, what song could I pick that would get, I still want people out of their seats and like dancing and cause it's, I'm never going to score another goal in the NHL. This is my one time doing it. This is the goal that's going to be play, the song that's going to be played. So I was, this might not be the tops of my list. Cause I, I literally couldn't think of anything, but I just kept coming back to, I'm going to go Shakira. My hips don't lie. <laughs> the whole crowd's going to be dancing. Whole crowd's going to be shimmying and shaking. So I'm going with that one because I wanted a little awkward, but everybody can join in on the fun. That is a, that's a good one. Uh, a couple of the, for people who might not know this, by the way, a um, couple of my personal favorites, Fishing in the Dark by the Nitty Gritty Band. That's from that Tate Thompson song this year. Uh, Jeff Skinner went with Breaking Free, which is from a high school musical. Um, that That's really good. Well, there's a couple other ones that are like Jukebox Hero, Casey Middlestat. Um, what was the one other one too? Eric Johnson. I don't think you're going to hear that. All Almost heard it tonight already, almost though. Land of a Thousand Dances. Um, that's an oldie. That That's one of my favorites too. Undefeated is Zach Benson's Narco. I hate Narco. I got a song I got so played out. Jacob Bryson, that's his song. Um, who knows if he's even going to, when he's going to be on there. Humble by Kendrick Lamar. I do like that song. And I'm not a huge modern hip hop guy. But that's Rasmus Dahlin's song, so uh, I feel like we might be hearing that a lot. A couple of people got Drake songs. I'm not a Drake guy. Tell you what mine is, though. I'm going to go back to the 80s. Cheesy, because I'm a cheesy dude, man. I would want it cheesy as possible. Shakira's tough to beat, man. Wham, wake me up before you go-go. You do the jitterbug. I like it. People, oh, my God. People would be partying and jitterbugging and dancing in the stands when I lit the lamp. It would be awesome. That That would be my shit, man. I, I I know some people don't like the Jeff Skinner songs, but I mean, Party in the USA two years ago, what was it last year? Um, Dance with somebody from Whitney Houston. And now yes, this year, he yes. went to a musical. He is oh, on point year. with his goal songs. He knows exactly what he wants from the crowd. And with a guy that you know scores as many goals as he does, you're going to be hearing that song over and over and over. And that crowd is going to go absolutely insane. Like people that are like, what? early late twenties are going to go absolutely bananas. Yeah. You know what? And I forgot you were right too. Part in the USA was two years ago. It was Whitney. Um, last last year, year. Yeah. 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 Anyway. All right. Um, that's going to do it for this episode. Make sure you give uh PK a follow at PK underscore BSC. I'll tell you what, let's end it this way. Tell people, because I know you guys switch up your podcast, but tell people briefly a little bit about your podcast, what you're doing with it. And when you guys, uh, cause you're, you, it's not a solo podcast for you. And when you, uh, you drop your show. Yeah. Me and Phil, my co-host, uh, through, I think it's going to be the middle of November. We're just Wednesdays. And then as soon as the middle of November kicks off, we're going Monday and Friday. Like we normally do all the way through June. We're a main bandits show. Like they're, yep. they're the major component of our show, but we're still talking bills, nonstop we're still talking savers nonstop so those are still sprinkled in we i think we got to try to control ourselves because we're nonstop talking about them and i'm like okay it's 30 minutes in our main talking point here the last 30 is supposed to be the bandits i gotta try to wrap this up so i'm trying because me and phil can go on tangents like i'm going right now but yeah it's it's mostly bandits with band or bills and savers i guess secondary you would call it but they're still on all three teams are still on every show Make sure you guys check it out, especially for the Bandits talk. I'm going to be listening to it and stealing thoughts from you guys when the season starts because I plan on going to a lot of Bandits games this year. But anyway, that is going to do it. I will be back with a a post-game show on Sunday night, and I'm warning everybody right now the Bills better win because if they don't, I am going to be completely fucking insufferable. Talk to you then. (laughs) 